cyber theft, cyber crime. Am I a victim? How do I know? Well, in this video, we're going to take a deep dive into cybersecurity and cyber theft with Officer John Greiner of the Indiana State Cyber Crimes Division. In this video, we're going to go through some deep dives on how to protect yourself against cyber crime, what kind of crimes are out there, and what you can do if you've been scammed and how to report it. <laughs> hey guys, my name is John Greiner. Just a little quick thing about me. Uh, I go here to Faith, I'm a deacon here. Um, also, I've been in law enforcement for over 15 years. I split my time, I work for the Clinton County Sheriff's Office, but I also work on the state, um, child exploitation, human trafficking, and then I'm also a certified uh, instructor and helper with the National White Collar Crime Center. Um, all that to say, this is kind of the stuff that I work on. Um, I don't write a lot of traffic tickets anymore. I kind of deal with the zeros and ones. Um, with that being said, there are so many areas, and you can't really be an expert in everywhere, but my goal for tonight is not to make you guys experts, give you guys a little wisdom, because my guess is if some of these scams or frauds have not happened to you, maybe a mother or a family member, but then we're gonna even do a little bit of fun, and I'm gonna show you guys how easy it is to kind of get some of this information, because uh, my guess is you guys have worked really hard most of your life to earn a nice big nest egg. And one of the goals I kind of want to do is help you keep your nest egg because there's a lot of people out there who want to take that from you. Anybody like to go camping? Who's my campers here? Mm -hmm. Anybody got an RV? Oh. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what kind of RV that is right there? Big That's a 2008 uh, Puffin or Terran or whatever it is. <clears throat> Brand new, that's about a $90,000 RV. A lady and a husband had been saving their entire life and uh, they wanted to really get into the RV world. Does that sound like somebody you know or maybe yourself? Well, they were looking on Facebook, which is always the best place to look, and they found this camper that they'd been looking for at an unbelievable price, $60,000 below value. Well, they contacted the person because they're like, this is too good to be true. There's, there's, this has to be a scam but everybody wants to find out for themselves, right? So they contact this lady. Yeah, I'm selling it because I need to get rid of it. My husband and I bought this last year. He passed away, we had no life insurance. I'm gonna lose my house. I got to sell this today. I need $32,000 in the next 24 hours or I'm gonna be homeless. Who's having a problem with this story right now? <laughs> Who feels bad for this lady? The stars are aligning. <laughs> the stars yeah, right. are aligning. So they go, well, we don't have a long time to sit and think about this. We better make a decision and now. So then they call her back. We'll take it. Great. Can I bring it to you? you you'll bring me the, the RV? Absolutely. I need the money so bad. Hey, though, can you send me the check first? Yeah, we can do that. You guys are all laughing, but this happens every single day. So one of the things, the mistakes that they made, this wasn't a verified seller. So a lot of times on Facebook, now they'll start telling you if these are verified sellers. Well, do you guys think this was too good to be true? Yeah. Absolutely it was. Turned out this wasn't a female who lost her husband. This was actually a guy named Gregory Popos who lived in San Diego and was running this scheme out of a homeless shelter in San Diego. But he got $32,000 from them. Now, I don't know why he's living in a homeless shelter because when we got his search warrant returns for his phone and everything else, he had done this scam to 10 other people. He's probably had more money than some of us in this room did. But he wanted to stay at a homeless shelter because he didn't want it to make it look like he was, you know, he was comfortable there. Nobody was noticing this guy but he had probably more money in his bank account than I did, but not anymore. So what's your question? How do you know, find a verified, what's, how you So what that? you can do on Facebook, well, on, on Marketplace now, they will mm -hmm. actually give people that can rate them and, and will show you, hey, this person's rated four out of five, 4.2 out of five. And so I would look for other people that have rated these people. And, and then I would just also take everything with a skeptical aspect as well. You know, that's going to be the kind of the main bread and butter of some of these things is be skeptical. So yeah, this was, this was too good to be true. There were some really good warning signs on that. One, the next part that I didn't tell you guys about, when she had said, yes, let's do the deal, they were immediately passed off to another person to talk to. Now, if my wife 
was trying to sell something, would she hand you off to another person, to another person, to another person? Hey, you need to put the money into this bank account. You need to do it here. So that should have been a good story. It, the story also seemed too good to be true that they were all lining up. These things just happen sometimes, and, and if you think it's too good to be true, it probably is. Right. Another one, too, is she said that she was uh, selling this from Warsaw, Indiana. Now, this person lived in Clinton County. How far is Warsaw, Indiana? It's not very far, right? Not too long. The area code this person was using to sell the phone number out of was out of Austin, Texas. So that has been maybe a concern, too. Absolutely. They wanted a wire transfer right now. Hmm. Now, a wire transfer, you can do pretty quickly, but the problem with a wire transfer is there's no getting it back. So whenever they wanted that wire transfer, like, okay, this, is, this should be a really big red flag, and then they're going to take care of everything. Now, I don't know about you guys, but generally you have to have a little bit of skin in the game most of the time, right? right. If somebody tells you, we'll take care of everything, you give me the money, that's never a good sign. And then the timetable was we have to do it right now. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Mm -hmm. So like I said, it was a very sad incident. We were able to get the person who did this scam to them, but we were not able to get their money back. Mm -hmm. The money was gone. It was moved to offshore bank accounts, but we can never get it. So the reason I'm talking about that one is everybody in here, I guess, probably has a Facebook account, right? Mm -hmm. Or some sort of social media. <clears throat> Mike, does everybody have one? Yeah. So the, this potential of something like this happens all the time and could very well happen to you guys. So I want you guys to be aware of these type of tips. And this is another one. I actually worked this one with a special agent Paz out of the Indianapolis field office. A um, couple had lost their entire retirement savings to this one. Um, he had worked for AMVC Swine Services. Anybody know what AMVC is? Um, they're a national company. Uh, they do a lot with pigs. So obviously in Clinton County, we have a couple pigs over there. And so he was, he was a, um, a doctor for the pig services. He had worked his whole life, um, and he ended up getting cancer. Very sad story, not story, just really couldn't um, you know, get better. And so he was slowly dying. Well, the family had brought some hospice workers in. My guess is we all probably know some situation where somebody got sick and some hospice workers got brought in, right? Where things were kind of problematic was um, hospice workers were given allowed access to the entire house. Hmm. What ended up happening was one of the hospice workers saw the doctor's phone was laying out one day and there was no passcode set on the phone. So she decided when he was sleeping to go into the phone and got all of his bank account information, got his user account names, his passwords, sold those to somebody on the internet and they ended up losing $260,000 from their bank accounts, all gone. The only way we actually caught them was because they were doing large bank deposits in a bank in Alabama. Hmm. So anytime you do a bank deposit or withdraw of $10,000, I don't know if Greg's the money guy around here too, they have to do what's called a SARS report. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. So you, hmm. you, you don't have to do this, your bank does, but if you give me $10,000, both of our banks have to file that with the federal government. And that was the only way we figured it out was through these SARS reports. Anyway, one of the other problems that he had done too, and this is one of the big mistakes that he had, um, he was using a paper document for all of his passwords. Now my guess is you guys all have some uh, social media, email, maybe other uh, accounts. Are you writing those down on a piece of paper? <clears throat> if you are, this is a good story of why not to. Because the other thing he had had on his, or next to his phone, was a password, pretty much a piece of paper with all of his passwords on there. So the lady who had done this, all she did was took a, and it had this, the usernames and the websites. So literally he used the farmer's bank, it said farmer's bank, username, password. Hmm. So all she had to do was take a picture of that, send it to her friend, and they started moving the money around. Also had made the passwords pretty easy. You know, I won't say what his name was, but pretty much my name's John Griner. It was Jay Griner, <laughs> and his password was John Griner one Probably not the strongest password in the world. Um, so some of the key takeaways I want you guys to kind of think about when another case when it comes to this, you know, you're, you're letting people into your life, especially as you get older, um, your passwords, one, should probably not be written down on a piece of paper. Now, I'm not going to make you guys raise your hands because I'm, 
I have a feeling probably there's somebody in this room who has passwords on a piece of paper. We're going to talk about a better way to take care of that. Okay. But then another one too is you need to make your passwords a little bit more harder than your name and a number or your kid's name and a number. Because my guess is if I were to ask you guys, a lot of people around here use common passwords with either names or date of births or an anniversary. Have I hit on anybody's password yet? <laughs> Yeah, probably, or, or a dog. If you have a dog, please don't use your dog's name. That's, we, so the bad guys actually keep dictionaries, is what they're called, of common names that are used for people. The other problem, too, was the bank started uh, contacting the family about some withdrawals. Because you can't move $250,000 in one false swoop. You've got to do it incrementally. Well, the, the family wasn't uh, picking up the phone calls because he was so sick and they, they, did, they just they didn't really want to worry about it. Your husband's dying, do you really want to see the farmer's bank phone call? Well, probably not. So they were ignoring the phone calls uh, because they were too busy taking care of him. Mm -hmm. Now that's a sad situation, and, and where we actually found out, or the family found out about it was, his, after he had passed away, she wrote a check to the funeral service for $10,000 and it bounced. She's like, there's no way it bounced. She's like, there's there's three, three, four hundred thousand dollars in that account, and then she went online and saw it was all done. Mm. So uh, the bank actually was able to work back and get some of it, but the people who did this, I mean, they had pretty much moved it, and then they they were gone. There wasn't a whole lot of money left to recover. So some of the things I want you to take away from that case that I work is, be careful with your passwords. We're going to talk about a better way to do passwords here in a little bit, but just your passwords are very important. And then also keeping kind of like a, a better way of your user accounts that's not on a pad of paper. Um, and I know a lot of smart people who, who still keep a pad of paper with their, their passwords on it and their usernames. And Steve would probably echo this, not the best way to do it, right? Our passwords are stored by our iPhone. Yep, they are. <coughs> Is that safe? Well, I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, maybe you can answer it yourself. Uh, who has all the access to your iPhone? Is it you or is it Apple? It's not you. It's Apple. So Apple, if I were to send a search warrant as a police officer, let's just say you're my bad girl. You're okay. my bad girl. And I said I want all of stuff. And if I know your, either your phone number, your email, or what's called an IMEI number, I can get everything on that phone. Oh, really? Everything. I do it all the time. Do it all the time, bad guys. Well, so I can get your usernames, I can get your passwords, um, and then if I can, well, this is getting a little out of our league here, but if I can put what's called a check rain or checkmate software on there, um, I can actually uh, do everything to that phone without you even knowing about it. Now that's some pretty advanced stuff that we're not gonna really talk about, um, but that's why even storing your passwords necessarily on that phone uh, <coughs> would be a tricky business because all I also need is, and I'll even show it to you on my phone because I don't want you to pull your phone up. All I need is to go to settings and then I can go to face ID and passcode, put mine in. Um, and that's where all of my uh, passwords are actually stored. Is, <coughs> it's, it's in what's called a password list in here. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can actually go into there and find all of them that are stored. <coughs> so uh, not to get too technical, but that passwords list is not really protected very good on that phone. Um, it's just a, it would be a text document <coughs> is all it is. And it's not very well protected. So um, we're going to talk about maybe a better way of protecting things than just letting your phone do the work for you. Now, it's not a bad thing. It's better than a notepad, but it's definitely not the best. When you talk about pass passwords, are you uh, referring more to uh, bank accounts and that type of thing? Or if you had passwords to Macy's, the Absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. 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 And here's why. Uh, another case that I worked, one of the problems that we're having in law enforcement <coughs> is social media accounts don't do a great job of preventing hackers from getting in. So how many times have you seen on your Facebook news feed um, somebody post something that's completely inappropriate? You're like, there's no way Greg Boyer would post that bad picture. Well, it's because Greg Boyer's account was easily compromised, either through a bad password or honestly, Facebook does not stop people after multiple attempts being used. So when I say passwords, I mean everything from your Macy's account 
to your bank account to Social Security. And the reason for that is um, all of that information is connected. Mm -hmm. So you have an email, if you have a Macy's account that has an email, right? Mm -hmm. So it's probably a Google or a Yahoo would be my guess, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if I can figure out that Google or that Yahoo account, I can actually try to get Google to forcibly reset your password. And if I can get Google to do that, now I can go into your activity and your browsing history and see every single one of your websites that you have username <clears throat> and password with. That easy. That's how your Macy's account can get your bank account hacked. I guess my question is, am I in danger? Oh, we all are. Who's going to tell us no, how to get no, out? No, because I, I, my um, Facebook account was completely taken over. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were no clues that they gave that unlocked it yep. at all. And requests through chat to Facebook for help. Probably did nothing. Nil. Mm -hmm. Yep, they won't do anything. They don't care. No. They, so th is there a danger in that right there? Well, that, that yeah, somebody's presenting they to the me. door. Yeah, in some aspects, yes. My suggestion is. Um, you know, stick tuned to the class. We're going to talk a little bit more about how to help yourself uh, because the, the age you live in, your online identity is almost as important in some ways as your actual identity, right? Um, what you're doing on Facebook can really get people in trouble from a legal perspective or also they can just gain information from you elsewhere. Um, and part of that's because now places like Facebook, they have banks, they have credit cards. And, and so we wouldn't want you to have your financial information compromised that way, okay? <laughs> Great questions. Identity theft. Has anybody actually ever had their identity stolen here? In just the United States, 5.7 million total things per year with almost 10, over $10 billion loss. That's a lot of money, right? I hate to break it to you. I'm looking around the room. I think I might be the youngest guy here. Not mm -hmm. trying to be mean or anything, but your demographic is the most vulnerable. Or suckers. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you guys are the most common target? Because we have the most money. You do have the most money. We're more trusting. You are very trusting. You are the most trusting generation by far. So one, they know that, but then the other part too is they understand they can lose you in the weeds a lot quicker than they can the younger generation, right? right? So for example, my wife, uh, she has her grandparents are 91 and 89. Um, and we were at her house, at their house, this was probably about two or three months ago, <coughs> and a bad guy calls up the phone and Harold being 91, the nicest guy you've ever met. I don't think he's even sinned once. He's such a great guy. He picks up yes, the phone. Yes, he has, John. Come maybe on just once or twice. It was when he was like two. Yeah. Um, but he picks up the phone. He goes, hello. And the guy on the other line goes, Grandpa, is that you? Well, the nice thing was, Harold, even though he's kind of struggling in his older age, he has no grandsons. He only has granddaughters. Oh, so he immediately was, was like, "I, Grandpa, but you don't sound like my granddaughters. And I'm like, Harold, give me that phone right now. Oh, boy. So there's a lot of scams out there, and your generation tends to be the one um, that, that struggles with it the most simply because of your age. So that's why we're talking a lot about this. Now, this is where things are going to start getting interesting, okay? <laughs> we're going to take a little bit of a dark dive to work. So, all right. So... This might help you a little bit more. Uh, when you guys get on Google, what do you guys call that when you get on Google? The internet, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. What if I told you there were three internets out there and you guys only go to one of them? Would you believe me? Yeah. Sure. So have you ever heard of the dark web? We're going to go through what's called the Tor browser. There, there's three types of internets. There's the regular web, the dark web, and then there's the deep web. The deep web would be like infrastructure that's common to a certain company like IU Health, for example. They have information that's th that is internet-based, but it's only through their servers. You have to have access. The dark web, you guys can go home and do what we're about ready to do. It'll probably be a little challenging because it's kind of difficult to navigate the dark web because there's no Google for the dark web at all. But one of the things you guys are going to start seeing is data breach information. So when I say a data breached information, does anybody know what I mean by a data breached information? 
What if I were to tell you every single American's information has been data breached at some point in the last five years? I would agree. And here's how, I, here's how we know that. One, the, the two largest medical insurance companies have all had their entire data list completely taken, which covers 110% of America. So do the math. We are all covered. If you've had medical insurance in the last five years, your data, your name, your date of birth, your social, Probably your email and most likely um, your home address is online for very easy purchase, literally for less than a dollar. The other thing on there is your credit cards. I'll ask you this question. When you go out to eat and you pay with a credit card, right, because we always pay by credit cards, how do you pay? Do you give the waitress your credit card? Mm -hmm. Not anymore. Why not? Because I got, I got my information. When I, when I give my credit card to a waitress, it went away out of my sight. Absolutely. And it got, it got, uh, I got a phone call a few days later from my mm. credit card company that they had an unsuspecting or yep. unusual um, purchase. Yeah, and they do that all based on location data. That's how they do that. Right. They, because you probably have that credit card at, at, tied to a bank, right? Mm -hmm. mm, no. Well, you have to have it tied to a bank, a credit card. Well. And that phone you have right there is an Apple phone. Mm -hmm. And that bank you're using, if I were to tell you that bank that you use, whatever bank it is, pays Apple money to know where you're at. Did you know that? If you open up your region's banking app, there is nothing on the region's banking app to show you where your location is, right? Does anybody else use regions? You use regions? Anywhere in there that can show you your location. They show you your location that you're at. Like shows that you're in Lafayette, Indiana. Probably. There's I, nothing that shows. I promise you there's nothing. Okay. But the reason Regions is tracking you, Chase Bank is tracking your location, is because when your credit card got used in California. That's where it was. Because <laughs> that's almost, that's where they always go. They said, hey, we see your phone that's tied to that bank account is in Indiana, but it's being swiped in California. That's physically impossible. Mm -hmm. And that's how they know it was a scam. But think about it like this, when you've gone on vacation, why are they not saying, this is really suspicious? She's in New York. So yeah, these banks are actually paying Apple and Google, because Google runs Android, lots of money to know where you're at so that they can see if you're getting scammed before you even know it. Which is a good thing. <clears throat> so what you have here is actually, I went to Tor. So this is an example um, from Biden Cash, where, um, for example, this person this is their credit card, this is their rating, expiration, this is where they live in the United States, because what you don't want to do is, if you're in California, you don't want to buy somebody from Lafayette's in Indiana information, right. they'll tell you, and this is how much money it'll cost you, $25, hmm. to get their credit card. We're going to go there here in a little bit, and I'll show you guys how easy this is to do. We're actually going to take a little, little tour to the dark web, show you guys how this all works. So... <clears throat> You guys ready to have fun? Yeah. So the first place we're going to go is Horizon. Now, I don't think you guys can probably read it too well, but you guys know what a URL link is, right? Like www.google.com. Can anybody read what the URL is up here? No. No, it's just a bunch of random num numbers and letters with dot onion. So the thing you need to know, and I'm not asking you guys to ever go here, you can't just find these places. You have to know where you're going either through, you, I mean, I do a lot of undercover work, so we actually do this stuff, but this is, this looks like something you would see on the regular web, right? Mm -hmm. Guess what? This is a place where we can go buy people's credit cards. I am ready to order right now. <laughs> you see that right there? Yeah. So this is all for buying people's credit cards. <laughs> so if you've ever heard of people getting hacked or ransomware, has anybody heard about that? Mm -hmm. I showed Steve this one a little bit before you guys started. This is a tour website for it. It's a little blurry. Let's see if I can maybe zoom in just a little bit to make it a little bit better. Uh, this is a tour website for buying malware or ransomware. That's it. I have to click on the program that I want. Let's say I want the no name. Click it right here. Got to pay probably $500. And then I have myself my own nice little ransomware, and I can send that to Faith Christian School or Faith School as a person, like I'll just say I'm Pastor Viers or P. Viers, and 
send it to one of the ladies, and all I need her to do is click it one time. Am I right? That's pretty easy. That's all I got to do. I got to get one as person as it is. to click it at one time in the network, and that's it. And that's how I get my ransomware right here. So I can go to different websites that can sell them, Dark Leap Market, Industrial Spire Market Up. Hmm. Obviously, once again, if you look at the URL up here, you're probably not going to guess that one, right? Mm -mm. Yeah. Ransom. Yeah, it's got the first part. <laughs> first part, ransom. That. But everything after that, you're probably it's not guessing that. So. so don't copy it back. <laughs> Good luck. We're going to get out there. Right. How about this one? This is on the dark web. Who's that? CIA. You guys know the CIA runs its own dark web? What do you think the purpose of that is? Catching people. Catch him. Actually, it's not. The CIA uses this to communicate with people. So, obviously, our government has a lot of spies and people overseas. Um, and so, they have their own Tor browsing website. So, they use that to help people. So, we're going to just talk really quick. What TOR actually stands for is it's the, it's the onion routing network. That's what it is, the onion <laughs> router. And what it does is, you guys don't need to write this down. It pretty much just allows people to hide where they're at and not be able to get access. But one of the things I wanted to show you is how easy it was to get credit cards, <clears throat> emails, personal information, ransomware. If I know where I'm going, less than $100, I can ruin somebody's life. I don't right. care whose life it is. That's how easy it is. So one, be careful what you're clicking on. That's where we're going with this. Mm -hmm. Has anybody ever gotten an email from somebody they may or may not have known? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about an email that looked like from somebody they knew? Uh -huh. That even gets worse, right? Because uh -huh. you were saying with your mom, well, it looked like it was from Comcast, right? Let's talk about some common scams. We talked a little bit about the relative one. Anybody ever got a call from the IRS? Yep. Oh, yeah. yep. How do you know that one's already fake? IRS they never calls you. They are actually prohibited by law from calling you. Did you know that? <laughs> the IRS cannot <clears throat> call you. Isn't that the same with Medicare? I don't know about the Medi Medicare side, to be honest with you. I don't, would you? Medicare, you'll typically will have a local representative that will right. work like a caseworker yeah, for that. Downtown yeah, downtown yeah. But that. They, you won't just get random out of the blue calls. Mm, okay. Like that. But my, my mother-in-law will get, um, these really official looking letters that say Medicare approved, you know, remedies for this kind of stuff and you open it up and it's, you know, check the box here, no payment necessary, send it in. Well, the fine print down here that most of us can't read is, well, that follow-up will be a payment. You're not gonna get something for free. Right. Uh, there for a while, there was this thing going on about these walkers. You know, Medicare approved, no payment necessary, check here, sign here you don't get a walker and you've just given up like 15 payments of you know, like 20 bucks. Yeah, I, I hang up on them. <laughs> yep. you, you almost have to be rude these days. Yes, like I'm not that's what's hard to too. Uh, the fake charity scam. <laughs> I am with so-and-so, we're trying to raise money so the police can have bulletproof uh -huh. vests. Will you uh -huh. send us money? One, there's a federal law that requires us to have them for the last 30 years. So um, the government has to give them to us for free. So two, just be realizing there's, there's charity scams after everywhere. So the thing that I usually tell people that struggle with charity scams is the God, the Lord bless you with the best charity in the world. Give your money to the church and let the pastors figure out where it needs to go. Yes. You know, if you're really struggling with it, you know, call a pastor. So uh, the tech support one, this is one of my other favorite mm -hmm. ones. Hey, yes. we were on your, uh, we were scanning your network the other day and we saw that you had a virus. Anybody ever gotten that one? That one's, yes. that one's become pretty common again. It used to, it kind of dropped off. Um, we'd like to help you out. We're gonna send you an email. This is your email, right? No, no, that's not one. Oh yeah, that's right, we have your other one down. We're sorry. Mm -hmm. And then they send you something and hey, we need you to click on that. And what did you just do? So just realize there are tons. There, I can't go through all the scams, but there are so many out there, it's almost hard to to go through it. What about access through Facebook? Because I've gotten friend requests that came under a woman's name that I knew from a church mm -hmm. in Florida. You know, Facebook is a standalone application, usually on a mobile device mm -hmm. like a phone or a tablet. Now, if they send you a link and you click on that link, oh yeah. yeah that's right. But as long as you're just using the Facebook messaging app, you're fine. Now, <clears throat> what I would tell you about social media is it's easy for anybody to be anybody. So for example, I'm not struggling with my identity. 
but I'm a 14 year old girl online because mm -hmm. I'm trying to catch bad guys. So, but I have pictures that we use AI technology to make, I, I can take a picture of my shaven face and I can look like a 14 year old girl. So be wary of who you're accepting a friend request from. Yeah, I refused it. Um, because uh, there, are, there are more fake social media accounts out there probably than there are real ones, right. to be honest with you. <laughs> so just realize when it comes to social media, be very, very skeptical. Be, you know, be okay with being a little rude to people because you don't know if that person's real. You have no clue if that person is truly who you think they are. So just be very careful of who you're letting in your circle, even with social media. Okay. The other thing too is when you accept a friend request, they now see all your friends. Yes. So now they have access to all that. Now, the problem with Facebook is sometimes they like to randomly reset everybody's security uh, mm -hmm. to minimal standards. So you may have yourself set to friends only or friends of like who can see your posts, who can communicate with other friends. So there's public, there's friends only, and there's friends of friends. So depending on where you set that, uh, you could open the door for that person, that bad actor, to now access pictures and everything uh, as deep as your friends list. So then they start scraping all that additional information. So it may not be specific that, hey, you know, we're just looking for you. We, we've got, now we've got all your 180 people with friends or whatever it is. My one advice I give to everybody, I, you can even do this to your adolescent kids. If anybody, I'm, I think I'm the only one who's right. got kids under 18. Um, all of my kids are under 10, and their credit scores are frozen. My first thing I would can really want to get to you guys, if you don't take anything away from this class, go home and tomorrow contact one of the three credit unions and just have your credit frozen. Mm -hmm. Do you need another credit card? Probably not. Do you need a higher credit card? If you have $20,000, do you really need $30,000? Probably not. If you put a credit lock on one credit card agency, TransUnion, Equifax, it doesn't matter, it goes for all three of them. Mm. And if you're a bad guy trying to open a credit card in my name, it immediately shuts down. So mm. that would definitely be my best suggestion of anything to do. Is that all, if you take one thing away from today, please take that away. Because even if you screw everything else up, <laughs> you can't get that screwed up. I got a thumbs up, I like it. But what it does do is if somebody tries to open up a credit card in your name, because your name, your date of birth, and your social are on the internet, what it does is it blocks them from doing it. Because anytime somebody wants to open up a credit card, by law, they have to contact one of the credit reporting bureaus. And they say, oh, Greg Boyer cannot open up a credit card. And they go, the bad guy goes, well, why can't I? Well, because there's a credit freeze. And he goes, done with that account. Not even going to mess with it. Yeah, you can pay a company a lot of money to do this, or you can spend 15 minutes and do it yourself. All right, who does this? Bad guys, most of the time they're overseas, Asian countries, or Americans who need more money. They are not your friends most of the time, but they sometimes can't be. Um, other times there are people or family members who have access to your accounts. I've worked a lot of grandkids steal grandparents' information accounts. I hate to say that. Um, one of the more common ones that people don't talk about a lot is Hey, Grandpa or Grandma, you need help with your bills. Let me get you set up with an online account. I'm going to give myself access to the account, not tell you about it, and then I'm going to start taking some money as a charge fee. Just be aware of if you, I'm not saying all your grandkids are bad or all your kids, <laughs> just, just check your bank account and be aware of who actually has access to that because they may give that information to somebody else as well. All right, bad news. Let's get to the good news because like I said, it's like the gospel. We have some bad news and we need to get to the good news. Help, what should I do? One, always verify information. If somebody calls you and says, Mr. Boyer, um, we need you to verify with us so we can send you some information, what should your answer always be? Click. I probably wouldn't answer if probably I make not. them tell me yeah. what, what my address is if yeah, you, you really know, want I'm, to know I'm, it. I'm not verifying nothing with you over the phone. Have a nice day. If these people don't need you to. Now there are certain places, for example, like if you're calling the medical doctor's office and setting stuff up, that's very different. But if you're getting cold called out of the blue, never verify information. You never give personal information over the phone, even if it's just a little bit. Only talk to verify phone numbers. I think I've seen everybody here has an Apple phone, it looked like to me. 
Everybody had an Apple phone, right? I, think you do. I, was, I was checking them all out, but you guys all have them out. <laughs> Apple will actually tell you if it's most likely a spam call. Did you guys know that? Mm -hmm. yeah. It will also tell you if it's a verified phone number. <laughs> Ignore calls and text messages from people that you don't know. Let them leave a voicemail. Bad guys generally don't leave you a voicemail, right? <clears throat> So don't you can be rude from now on. This is my blessing. <laughs> be rude to some people when you don't know who they are. <laughs> passwords. Um, it is the key to your account. Who here changes their password more than once a year? Because <laughs> you have to. Mm -hmm. Who here changes their password more than once every two years? Who only does it when you forgot it and you had to reset it? <laughs> How did you do that? Through your email, right? So what do we talk about bad guys being able to find your email? Mm -hmm. See how important it is to have your passwords? My best suggestion is use things that are called password managers. Does anybody know what a password manager is? Nothing. So what we're gonna do guys, if you look on here, um, anybody ever used Google? Does anybody use Google's password manager? No. Okay, so I would highly suggest actually using Google's password manager, and here is why. So we're going to go into Password Manager. So Google Password Manager. All right. And this will store all of your passwords in what's called pretty much an unbreakable. Well, I don't know if I have it set up right now. So um, I don't have any stored in here. But if I did, Google would store those for me. But what Google will force you to do before you ever do it is they will make you actually. So if you look right here, these are all the passwords that Google stores for me. Okay, I'll log into my ATF one really quick. It doesn't have anything on there that you guys can see. It will actually make me re-enter my password into Google in order for me to view what that password is. Okay, so my suggestion when it comes to managing your guys' passwords is Google is probably, and I'm trying to make it easy for you guys, Google is the best place to manage them. So John, explain though. what. You said use your password. Which password is that? It'll Explain be, what this really does. It'll, you have to use the password on your computer or the device that you are using. So for example, if I am using the password manager at Google on my iPhone, I have to use my biometric face or the passcode on my phone. If I'm using it on my computer, since I have this face set up on here, I have to use my face or the passcode on my computer. That's the only way it'll work. So the good thing about that is you have two levels of authentication, through Google and through the computer. Hmm. Google, every time you use a Google account, it says, hey, we've not recognized that device before. Right. Verify hmm. through using your YouTube app, okay? So Google is actually probably one of the best places, I would say, for our clientele here to manage your password. And they will give you a randomly long, probably 12 to 16 mm -hmm. number alpha digit type thing that you will not be able to break if you're a bad guy. So that would be my suggestion is start using the Google and I'm sure Steve could probably put a link in how to use Google's password manager because it really is I personally think the best one out there. Well when you do use your password please don't make them your family names or date of births. Please don't. Okay. Also use what's called two-factor authentication. Does anybody know what two-factor authentication is? Greg, tell us what two-factor authentication is you enter it and then your password then they're either going to send you a text or an email that you have yeah. to verify with some numbers most most websites banks even facebook you can have that set up as two-factor i would highly encourage you if you have facebook if you have google if you have a banking application please use two-factor authentication it's so important if you have a bank if you have a banking application on your phone your bank most likely offers this service for you. If you don't know how to do it, contact your bank and they will be more than glad to help you getting that set up. So a lot of times what most websites will do is if it's the first time you ever logged into that account from that, that machine, it will require that. The reason for that being, whenever you log into an account, that website is asking for some information. One of them is called an IP address. That's kind of like your mailbox. Okay. The other thing is like known as a MAC address. And the other thing is the computer and the build model. Well, if Regions Bank says, I've never seen these informations before, that's them going, I'm kind of suspicious of what you're doing over here. Right. And so they want you to prove you're the good guy. 
So that's just the bank's way of saying, I've never seen those three numbers before. So I'll make you prove it. Now there's also sometimes, for example, uh, your bank may be set up, hey, every six months, we're just gonna make you prove it. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you and I would encourage everybody, you can have those applications say, every time I log into my bank account, mm -hmm. make me prove it. Make right. me prove it every time. Because if you're the good guy, you'll always be able to prove it, right? And the same thing for Facebook. Hey, you know what? If anybody wants to log into my Facebook, you need to send this email to the, my email account or send this text message to my phone. That's the best thing you can do to prevent yourself from being hacked. Because I know you guys have to use 2FA all the time, right? All the time. Greg, I'm sure you guys have to all Some the time. places are, yeah. It's a little annoying. Yeah, but, right. right. So are you saying, Joan, that if, you're, if you go to a particular website, you would have to have a different password whether you're going on your phone versus your laptop? Yeah, so those are all different machines. So for example, you've logged into your stuff probably a hundred times on that phone. If I give you my phone, that website should never have seen this before, right? What about my laptop? Well, the first time, yes. You should never have seen that before. Well, then those companies, they store that information. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've seen that IP, we've seen that MAC address, and we've seen that machine build number. We've seen those before. Mm -hmm. So then they don't usually ask it for you again. Right. So that's one of the main ways they prevent people from overseas from knowing if you've been truly hacked. The first way is through what's called your IP address. That's kind of like your mailbox for the internet is what that is. Right. Question, or just to clarify, Susie and I want to know, because she's talking about the password part of it, not the two-factor authentication. Right. Yeah, generally so speaking, if you do the Google, you have to have two different creative passwords to be able to access your passwords? Well, no, Google will store it, and every time you use it, then yes, it'll be on that machine, will be different. So Google... But I, gotta get, I, have, I have to have a password to get into the Google your password your, manager. That's yes. the same. That's the same as what your password is to your email. Mm -hmm. But then in order to view those passwords, you will have to use the password either on your phone or your laptop. Because what Google forces that computer to do is it goes into like an administrative setting, is what it pretty much, it's a little complicated, but it says, hey, we're gonna force you to show us you're the administrator of that device. If you can't, mm -hmm. it's gonna time out. A yeah. little complicated, but as long as you have the password to your phone and to your account, you'll be golden. But, okay, my phone, his phone and our two iPads and our computer are all linked. Mm -hmm. So my passwords that will be in this password manager would apply to each of those devices? Yeah, it could. Okay. As long as you're using the same email. Mm -hmm. Right. Or Google account. But if you'll notice, what's my last slide say? <laughs> Don't link multiple accounts. The problem is when you start linking things, if I get access to one, I can access them all. Right. You're talking about like husband and wife either. Absolutely. Okay. Or even, I mean, it just it gets kind of tricky. Um, because okay. I get there's a convenience thing in life. I totally get it. So like, for example, my wife has access to all of my personal emails. She can't have my police stuff. But if for some reason her Gmail got compromised, she has access to mine because it's a linked account. Mm -hmm. Now we do that for transparency in our marriage. I tell all young people, you guys all need to share stuff. But like <laughs> the police side of me goes, I don't know, cause my wife's not as savvy as I am. I get a little nervous that she's got access because I don't want her to click on something and then my Google account gets hacked. So just beware, I, I get it, it's very convenient. But linking accounts can be dangerous. So what do we do? First thing, you always call local law enforcement. Any of this bad stuff happens, generally there's some guy who's kind of a nerd who can help you out. The next thing we would ask you to do is to go to ic3.gov. That's the Internet Crime Complaint Center that's ran by the FBI. Uh, they won't generally reach out to you, but they will reach out to us. Uh, also, the BBB. Anybody ever use the Better Business Bureau? Mm -hmm. They do a phenomenal job of uh, doing scam trackers. So if you do ever get taken advantage of, or if somebody ever does try to take advantage of you, and you don't lose that money, we would ask still that you would contact the BBB. And then if you lose some really big money, FinCEN is another great place to go. That's where the police should go. You don't need to necessarily go there. When's the last time you contacted your bank 
your financial representatives to make sure they have your correct information. Anybody called their bank lately and said, hey bank, I just want to make sure you got my right phone number, my right email, my right everything. How often would we need to do that if none of that data has changed? Yeah. Um, if it hasn't changed, then probably oh, not okay. a whole lot. I would just verify it. Okay. A lot of times you can do this over the internet. If you have an account with them, you can verify these things. But if you do change your phone number, please let your bank know. Sure. Right? If you, and only, like I said, I want you guys to also be using less emails. Mm -hmm. This is a question I could have asked earlier. Does anybody have more than two email accounts? Probably one, work one, one personal. personal. One. Yeah. So make sure they have that updated information, right? <laughs> Another thing, make sure if you move, because some of us sometimes will move and we'll forget to tell our banks about that. But also, you can let your banks know who trusted points of contact are. Did you guys know that? That is a new thing on most of your financial things, is having a trusted <clears throat> contact. And I can't tell you how important <clears throat> that is to have. Greg, why is that important to have? Because <laughs> as a financial representative, if I think, I'm going to pick on you, Susie. I think Susie's not doing well, and you're <laughs> wanting to withdraw $50,000, I need to know a person I can call to say, hey, is your mom, is she okay? Is, is she something going on? Legally, I cannot do that otherwise. I can't stop you from taking your money. But I will tell you, um, and not to get on a soapbox, but I'm probably the, well, he's younger than me, but I'm probably the next. I deal with older people. You people don't think any of your children know anything. <laughs> Most of my clients, their children are the last ones they want to talk to. And they're not bad kids. They just don't want to talk to their kids because, well, that's Greg Boyer. He's only 60 years old, and he's just my little boy, is my 84-year-old mother. <laughs> and I'm like, so who does she, she – and luckily my mother does talk to me. So please make sure you have trusted points of contacts on bank accounts, mm -hmm. retirement accounts, hmm. because um, it, it really is tough. And I've had to call some family members because I had a gentleman that was going to Parkinson's that he was calling me and his wife was completely sane, but she had always done what her husband told her to do. Mm -hmm. And he's over there they, saying, Sally, we need to withdraw that $50,000. Okay, sweetheart, we'll withdraw it. And I'm like, he is not well. I had to call the children and he was, had Parkinson's and had not been diagnosed yet. Well, and the other reason it's good, too, is uh, Greg does my financial stuff for our, our life insurance as well. Um, Greg knows me well enough to know that if I called him up and made some goofy decision that didn't sound like John, mm -hmm. he's probably going to call Jen next, right? right. So just, just realize, and this is going to sound crazy, these, these banks don't want you to lose money. These credit cards actually don't want you to lose money mm -hmm. because a lot of times they're on the hook for it, too. So mm -hmm. that trusted point of contact that you can give to them is almost invaluable at times. And I would really encourage you, make sure it's somebody you do trust. But then you have to trust them, okay? And put those in there, all right? All right, finally, we're gonna make that computer work a little more for you. Does everybody have an actual computer at home or does most people just have a phone? Computer. Most people here have a computer, probably. All right. We're going to talk about what your actual web browser is. So when I say web browser, what I mean by that is that's the little thing that you click on down here that gets you to the internet, right? My best suggestion for you guys is pick one and stick with it, mm -hmm. okay? And the reason for that is um, they really can do a good job of keeping track of what you're doing. Um, I'm not a representative from Google, but I will tell you <laughs> Google is probably the best one out there. Um, Firefox is another great one, and then probably Bing is okay. Once again, these all have password managers on them, and they will do a great job of, of not allowing you to initially go to what's known as a harmful site if you click on one. But they all have password managers that can help you guys, and then they can also help you out if they think you're going to or clicking on a bad thing. And then the final thing is, if you're not for sure about some of the stuff that's getting out there, don't click on those links. All right. Yeah. Got a lot going. <clears throat> DuckDuckGo is that another one? Why are you using DuckDuckGo? Because I heard Google was just taking, sucking all our information and sharing and doing all. Absolutely, they're, they're. I mean, if you really want to know how Google, if, if you, how much do you pay for your Google accounts? I honestly don't. Know. 
You pay zero most of the time for it. So what does that mean you are? You're the product. Mm -hmm. Just think about it. If it's free, you're the product. You gotta come to terms with that. If you're getting a free service from Facebook, from Google, that means you're the thing that's being bought, okay? Google does do a lot, we call it data mining, where they're putting parts of you, they're doing it through obfuscated numbers, they give you a randomized number and they track what you're doing and they sell your stuff for ads. That's, that's the basic gist of how they make money. You have to kind of make a decision, who am I okay with making money off of me? That's the nicest way I can say it. Google gives you the most power to control your abilities to see what's going on. The other companies, like the reason I really don't like Safari, Apple makes a great phone and they make a ton of money off of selling you. They do the same thing off of your internet usage and they will totally not give you any control over what your settings and what you're able to sell or not be sold. Mm -hmm. Google, it's, it's the biggest guy on the block, but it also gives you the most control over your stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, DuckDuckGo is a, is everybody, so DuckDuckGo is a web browser. It's used for anonymous web browsing. Um, but once again, I'm gonna ask you this question. What does it cost you? All right, you guys have two phones and two, two iPads and computers. Manage your devices. Um, those electronic service providers, that's Facebook, and I'm, I'm sure nobody here has Snapchat, uh, but Instagram, stuff like that, they, uh, have the ability to still get on your old things. So for example, in the last couple of years, you may have gotten a new cell phone, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that old phone number, if you guys remember, the way they verify you is either by IP address, and you probably get home on your same Wi-Fi router every time, so that's gonna be the same. But that computer or that Mac address, those are gonna be different, but they've already been recognized by Facebook. So that old phone that you just so nicely handed to that you know young kid at AT&T who said, here's my old phone, you're assuming AT&T doesn't do anything with it, right? Well, those old devices, Facebook and your banks have recognized, be careful when either you're turning in old phones that, you're, that they're not getting factory reset because those devices can be used to access your accounts because they're already linked with it. There have been plenty of scams that have happened because you go to Verizon and some 19 year old kid says, you look like you don't know anything about anything. Let me transfer all of your data from your old phone to your new phone and I'm gonna take care of it. And then three weeks later, your bank account's been hacked. Well, how did that happen? Well, it's because guess what? When you gave him your phone, you gave him your passcode. And then what did he do after you left? He went into the back room, typed your passcode in, went to your farmer's bank and took your money out or sold your information. So be aware about what your old devices can do. They can still access your account because those accounts have been recognized by that device. Even if you wipe the device, can they still get it? No. So yeah, what I would do is, um, if you're gonna get a new phone at Verizon or at and and you turn that phone in, make them factory reset it in front of you. And then you would look at your phone, you tell them, I wanna look at my phone again, you open your phone and you look at your contact list, you look at your mail, there should, there should be, nothing be nothing there. Nothing there. So yeah, I mean, my goal is when you guys get rid of that iPad that you break or your grandkid, you let your grandkid have that, and he breaks that iPad, please don't just throw that iPad away. Right. Make sure you factory reset it or absolutely completely destroy it. Take a hammer to it, throw it in the fire, <laughs> do it something like that because that device, hard to practice. that device is still recognized by them. Um, also, don't save login information on the computers or devices that you don't frequently use. Right. Um, so for example, if your computer does go down for a little bit and you borrow one of your friends's or you go to your kids' house to log in, don't save that information on their computer because obviously they can get it. And then always read emails from, I say ESP, but let's bring up Facebook and Google about your bank account login information. Mm. If I were to take Greg's oh. phone right now and log into my Google account for the first time, I should get an email from Google saying, a new device is trying to log in. If you ever see that email from Google, from Facebook, from your bank, please don't ignore it. Mm -hmm. Read through it. And if you're like, I have not logged in, there will almost always be a click here to help or call the phone number. Please actually do it because I can't tell you how many times I've actually had people say, 
I got this email from my bank mm -hmm. where they said somebody logged in, but I just didn't read it because I get five emails from my bank a week. Well, I don't know what to tell you because they tried to warn you. The warning sign literally was there. Mm -hmm. Finally, be careful what you post. I think we came to the realization you all have Facebook, right? So Mark Zuckerberg is making a lot of money off you guys. Oh, yeah. Please don't post personal information. I have a question for you. How does everybody know it's your birthday on Facebook and tell you happy birthday? Oh, <laughs> because you put it in there. As Mark yeah. told me to. Now, Greg's my friend on Facebook. How many times have you ever told me happy birthday on Facebook? I'm not bitter about it. You never have because Facebook doesn't know my birthday. So you have somebody, and this is why your password is so important. And your managing of these things is so important because Facebook, honestly, won't help you. We kind of all have to be in that we're going to have to help each other type mm -hmm. thing. Okay? Please don't put your home address there because bad guys can find that out. Vacation plans. This is goes. Please don't tell people you're getting ready to go on vacation. My home is free. Right. Please come break into it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that one baffles me. Or okay. posting daily pictures while you're out of town. And then this is oh, kind of yeah. tough, but delete an old account that you don't use. Please do. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um, it does take a little bit of time. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to actually go through that whole process. But please do it because if you don't, man, the difficulties it can cause for you. It, it is tremendous. But you can do it, but it does take about 10 minutes to do it. Facebook does not have a nice big delete button up there. So if you found this video helpful, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons and share this with someone in your friends and family circle that needs to know more about how to protect themselves from cybercrime. And don't forget to check the details section for more videos and tips and tricks on preventing cyber theft. Thanks for watching.